Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another show of Fuente and Marifel present Meet the Professor Hello World. <clears throat> hey, Jeremiah, how are you, buddy? On Mother's Day, I couldn't be any better. Happy Mother's Day to everybody out there. Happy Mother's Day to all those mothers that do so much for us that sometimes uh, a lot of people take it for granted and do not appreciate it. Because I've always was taught that anybody could be a father, but nobody could be a mother. The love of a mother is above of anything uh, in the world. I lost my mother almost 20 years ago. Of course, I miss her every day. I miss my father every day. And for those people who have their parents still alive, take my word. You are bendecido. So what would the word in English be? You're blessed. I can tell you that. At my age, at 71, I'm a lucky man because I'm a COVID survivor, but I have learned throughout the years, your parents, you can have all the money in the world, all the acknowledgement in the world, but when you lose your parents, you lose part of your life. Truth. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well said, Jose. For once, you said it properly. <laughs> You know, that, that leads me to, uh, to, to the idea. We always talk about the sisters of the leaves, but what about the mothers of the leaf? Because at the end of the day, the birth of all births of tobacco, the gods of tobacco, what's behind everything is always the mothers of the leaf, isn't it? No, I agree. And, and you know, we've talked on the show for many times, you know, the, it, it's, it's a difficult world for women, but it's not really because the story has never been told. The women have always played a big role from the beginning of when the Tainos were out there planting the tobacco and when the Cubans started to make cigars, who was stripping the cigar, the leaves, who was putting on the labels, who was putting on the cellophanes, who was putting all those cigars in boxes. It was women all the time. There's factories that have more women than men working. And a woman can roll a cigar just as good as any man. I've seen women that fucking have impressed me rolling a cigar that I say, oh, my God, this cigar is perfect. It's a hundred. But I think now, because of social media, I would say the last 10, 15, 20 years, people have realized with all the tours in the factory how important the role of the woman is. And, and remember, and I, I mean, you've been going to factories since you were a little kid. Who's always doing the sorting of cigars 90% of the time? Women. Who's stripping and classifying binders and fillers and wrappers? Women. Who is looking closely to details on quality control? 95% is women. So believe it or not, women have a great, great role when it comes to cigar. Oh, yeah. No doubt about it. Absolutely. And we have our own mother of the leaf here on the show, and we are going to wish her a happy, happy Mother's Day. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the kid. Hi. Hey, Mama hey, Betty. what's up? Happy Mother's Day. Happy thank Mother's you. Day. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. What a gift it is actually to be a mom, to tell you the truth. That really is you know, I was thinking about that earlier. I was like, you know, what is it like to walk around and know that you cannot re you cannot procreate without a woman? Like you guys have to actually get along with us. No, there's no question. <laughs> but when you, when you say how blessed wait, you are wait, to be wait, a mother, I just made a giggle. Okay, I'm just gonna like put that out there. <laughs> no, no, it's true. It's true. It's true. I mean, don't don't break Jose's dream. He still thinks he can procreate with himself. And by the way. <laughs> By the way, when you said how fortunate you are to be a mother, that's because you didn't bring up two, two like Jose and I, trust me, because then all, <laughs> then all of a sudden you're like, hey, I don't feel so I, fortunate anymore. <laughs> so true. I was blessed. I have to tell everybody I was blessed with a beautiful daughter who is now 16 and very, I mean, got the greatest head on her shoulders. Thank God. So I don't know. <laughs> We get to just be uh, friends because, you know, she's pretty she's pretty smart on her own. So it's awesome. I'm a little spoiled that way, sir. <laughs> but 
how is your you guys have beautiful women in your life so happy mother's day to those beautiful women thank, thank you, you very thank much you. thank yeah, you yeah we went out to a we went out to lunch nice restaurant jasper me and and Emma. you took, you took your uh, wife out to lunch friend. don't say that <laughs> too loud because my wife's gonna cut my neck off man I completely well, forgot it was Mother's Day today. Oh well, my God! Well, no, you did not. Yeah, I no, did. You... I did. It's Sunday, and my my secretary doesn't work today. I I forgot. Oh my it's God! It's always Whoops. on Sunday. That's the lamest <laughs> excuse. No, nope, excuse that excuse. Next. Yeah, exactly. So I got to be very discreet. So stop making a big deal out of this thing, Jose. You're gonna get me in trouble again. No well, worries, Ho Jose. Happy Mother's Day to Emma and your beautiful, and then uh, obviously happy be Mother's Day to your beautiful wife as to Jeremiah, even though you forgot. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to hear all about it later on. <laughs> all right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, talking about Mother's Day, um, there's one thing that everybody in the world just as adores, whether it's a mother, whether it's a father, whether it's a child. But there's something very romantic about the guest which we're going to have on the show today. This, uh, this guest is a, um, a toy maker in, in his industry in a very similar way that Carlito is in the cigar industry. This man brings pleasure. This man brings smile onto most every mother's on the planet. Uh, this man is uh, an exceptional human being. Um, and the star of his universe. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to you to extend a warm welcome to the world's greatest chocolate maker, straight from Belgium, Mr. Benoit Nian. Benoit, welcome to the show. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Amazing. Benoit, it is such an honor and a pleasure to have you with us today on the show. Um, I've been following your work for decades. Um, you are, as far as I'm concerned, the most brilliant and competent uh, chocolate maker on the planet. Um, your creations are insane. You represent to the chocolate world what uh, Patek Philippe or uh, the, the, represents in the watch industry, what Arturo Fuente represents in the, in the, in the sorry, the Patek in the watch industry and Fuente in the cigar industry. Um, you you bring it to another level. Um, it is insane having you on on our show today, and I look very very much forward uh, to all of the amazing questions and the parallels between the chocolate world and the cigar world. This is going to be an extraordinary show. Benoit, welcome to our show. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all your compliments and also for inviting me here. I'm very sure glad to uh, to share my my passion today. <laughs> Benoit, uh, it is Wait, a hold pleasure. Hold, hold, before 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 we move on, Melanie. I told you there was going to be somebody special on the show today, right? Yes, I was. You're you're, st you're star you're starstruck. You're not talking anymore. I know. I was a little. I was trying to. I was trying to share it. I'm like, I want to share this with everybody so that they can all watch. But like. Yes, so Willy Wonka, can I get the golden ticket, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a good idea, yes. There there are, there are golden tickets in every every in all our products actually. <laughs> in all the products. Yes. Before we start the show, Benoit, um, please tell the audience out there a little bit of a, a little bit about yourself. Let's not get into the chocolates right away. Let's not get into your journey, your life, which is absolutely incredible. But let's get into who is Benoit Nian? Who's the man behind, you know, the white uniform behind the glasses? Who's this this gentleman which we're talking to today? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I'm uh, so I'm from Belgium. Uh, I'm 47 years old. Uh, and actually, I graduated as a, an engineer at the start. Um, and um, um, I, I, I had the opportunity to get a job uh, in the steel and military equipment um, when I finished my study. So even, even before I got my diploma, I was uh, able to, uh, to get a job. 
Um, but chocolate uh, and pastries about, uh, sorry, pastries made from chocolate uh, where have always been my passions. Um, I've, I've always practiced as a hobby. Uh, I've traveled for, for this hobby. Um, but only uh, when I was uh, 30, I decided to, uh, to live from my passion. I, I decided to quit my job um, and to, uh, to live from, uh, from, from chocolate production. That's, do, that's do, ab absolutely amazing. I, I, okay. I, I figure out that I, I, I see myself on the screen and nobody else, so it's a little bit confusing. <laughs> Don't worry, because this is exactly what the audience is seeing. So okay, they, okay. they're here to watch you, not me. Okay. okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Benoit, that, that's incredible. So from one day to the next, you gave up this whole life, this this whole education of yours in, in, in engineering at the highest level. And you had this urge in, in your stomach. You had this passion. You had you had these emotions for chocolate. Why? Why chocolate? Actually, um, chocolate is something very uh, sensual, something um, that, uh, that gives a lot of feelings to those who, uh, who eat it. And also a lot of uh, feelings to those who, um, um, who who produce it. It's a very complex uh, raw material. Cacao beans are very complex to handle. It's a very secret um, thing. It belongs mostly to the uh, industrial company. Uh, and when we started the, our adventure in the chocolate sector, we wanted to create the best Belgian chocolate. Actually, our, our purpose was to, uh, to bring it to another level um, because I don't know if you know that, but 99.9% .9 of uh, what you think are chocolate makers are actually remelting chocolate. They are buying raw materials, so chocolate, from multinationals. Uh, in the world, 95% um, of the chocolate that you can see and, and um, buy uh, has been transformed, so the beans um, to, to make them has been transformed transformed by five uh, industrial groups only. We wanted to, to, to be away from this. We wanted to be... Benoit, Benoit, are, are you telling us that 99.9% .9 of chocolate makers in the world don't actually make their chocolate? That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's that, the reality. That's, that's yeah, incredible. It. That's absolutely incredible. So there is there is 0.1% of people out there that 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 can actually say they make chocolate. And that is that is unreal. That is unreal. And and you know what? When I listen to you, the more I listen to you, the more I realize that you know you you um the, the conversations we're gonna have about the parallels between chocolate and tobacco and, and the cigar industry are probably very, very, very similar. But continue, please. Yeah, so, so um, starting from, from this, um, um, uh, so, so, so starting from the fact that uh, uh, the, the world of chocolate was not as uh, uh, interesting as we, as we thought, we, we wanted to uh, really create a real chocolate factory, starting from the, the cacao bean, um, producing um, with our own recipes, what should be the best Belgian chocolate. And so at the beginning, we started in a garage at the back of my parents' house. Um, we decided to create our first recipes. And as um, we have no family in the food sector, we decided to bring our first recipes to um, uh, recognized um, uh, Michelin star restaurant, like the Comme Chez Soi or Villa Lorraine in Brussels, for example. And we wanted to have from them uh, a feedback. Some uh, we wanted we wanted that they help us to develop our our recipes. But at the end, uh, so we had uh, some uh, appointments with them, and we uh, went away from those appointments with our first uh, orders. Actually, so we didn't get any uh, recommendations from them, but we got our first orders. Starting from there, we knew that uh, we could rely on our own uh, taste and our own way of seeing uh, what uh, high quality chocolate should be. That's incredible. That's unbelievable. I mean, for, for those out, out there who are listening to this, um, the, the, these, these top, top Michelin star restaurants are uh, 
considered by by most food junkies as you know the summum in the world of gastronomy and for them even to accept a, a meeting uh, with with somebody out there to present a new type of food or whatever it may be is is absolutely unique now these are the people who who lead gastronomy worldwide particularly in places like belgium and france and italy so having um a two or a three michelin star restaurant like comme chez soi or like le villa lorraine or other places like this who who are um, considered by most as as the finest dining places on the planet um for for a young chocolate maker uh, out of belgium where where it's the land of chocolate makers to have them uh, instantly fall in love with with benoit nian uh, and and select him off the bat out of nowhere as the supplier to the royal court so to speak because this is literally what what these places represent these these are the royal courts of food gastronomy um is an achievement um which which cannot be compared to anything else so benoit i'm please continue i'm i'm just um outlining to all of my friends here uh, which are watching this show how spectacular your journey has been Uh, actually, yes, uh, th this is what uh, this, this was rather uh, unbelievable for us because uh, um, we, as you said, uh, it's rather complicated to get an appointment with those uh, very famous uh, chefs and uh, receiving from them um, their, um, you know, they, the fact that they trust us uh, since the, the very the, beginning was their very bless uh, their blessing, their their coronation. Yes. Yes, well, we we are actually uh, actually they immediately understood uh, what was our difference. You know, there are in Belgium there are something like uh, three or four hundred little uh, chocolate shops around the country, um, um, but a a any uh, chef could uh, uh, be skeptical about a new proposal, saying, uh, "What what does these?" Uh, What do these new uh, people uh, will will offer to the to the market? Um, but they were curious enough to uh, to have us and to uh, exchange to uh, to have the delicacy to uh, to eat our products. And uh, yeah, immediately they found that there was a major difference uh, in comparison to what they usually eat. Um, and since then, we we were able to uh, to supply uh, their their famous tables. So then, then uh, of course, this was the, the first. This was the start of the, the company. Actually, these were our first uh, customers, um, and then we developed the um, the. the but but, but uh, what, tell me something. So, let's rewind a little bit. You're a young company. You're a young man. You produce your first chocolates out of your garage. family garage. You go to the finest food establishments on the planet, and you in instantly receive coronation. You're asked to become a supplier to the court. Um, where is this coming from? Why does this happen? Uh, actually, I, I I have no idea. Actually, when we contacted, well, I mean, if, if if you're the best, you're the best for a reason. Why? Yeah. <laughs> Because because we put all our passion to uh, to into that project, um, we decided to create uh, a range of products uh, for which we um, we never calculated. I mean, we when we make a recipe, uh, we don't have any calculator to uh, to uh, calculate the the margin that we could do on it. The only focus on our uh, adventure in chocolate was to achieve the best taste. So that means that uh, the first step was to find the the, the best beans. Um, that was probably the most critical part at the beginning, um, because 99, more than 99% of the cacao beans that are um, uh, um, used in the world are actually used by industrials, and industrials don't take care. Well, I mean, they, they don't care about the, the taste of the beans. They want to produce a high quantity of uh, chocolate per year. And that's about uh, what they care about. So we needed to find small uh, family producer producers who could uh, deliver some uh, very unique um, uh, cocoa beans. Um, it happens that uh, the, the 
people that we have found and that can deliver that kind of very high quality beans uh, have been helped by um, uh, engineers from uh, America or from Europe. Um, and by, by, by giving more added value to the bean at the um, country of origin, they are able to sell their, uh, their product at a price that is uh, far higher than the stock exchange price. I, I don't know if you know that, but the, the cacao bean is, um, uh, has a price that is determined by the uh, London or New York stock exchange. Um, to, to tell the truth, uh, this price, most of the time, doesn't allow the, the families to live properly. Um, in the, um, the way we work with farmers, um, we ask them to produce the best quality beans uh, that they have. So mostly old trees uh, living under the tropical forest in the shade. Um, and by the fact that they will respect those old trees, uh, they will procure uh, a very unique uh, cacao bean that they will be able to sell at a price that is between uh, four and sometimes 12, 12 times the price of the stock exchange. By, by uh, having that kind of direct relation with the farmers, we are able to, um, uh, to, to have a lot of pride um, because we know that uh, we, we, we don't live um, uh, be, be, because they are they are not living from it, they, we 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 form a kind of a family uh, with them. So the as I told you, the first um, complexity was to find the the right raw material. It took a long time to find them because we had to travel a lot and find uh, high quality beads in remote areas. Remote areas are places where it's more difficult for the industry to get in. So uh, that's maybe why it was uh, easier there. For example, in Venezuela, um, one of the plantations we have been working with is a plantation you can access only by the sea, by sea. So um, you, the, the farmers put uh, a truck on a small boat um, and then they go and they make a round in the water to come back to the, the the closest uh, harbor. So, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's very complex to get the beans and um, uh, that's maybe why uh, they were protected uh, because they, they were in a remote area. So after having uh, found the, the correct raw ingredients, we needed to find the proper way of processing those beans. And that's also complex because when we started the company, um, the only machines uh, that were um, uh, able on the that sorry that were uh, available on the market were machines um, for industrial companies like uh, um, machines that were able to produce maybe uh, 200 tons per day. So you you cannot start a small business with that kind of equipment. It's too large, too expensive. Uh, so we had to figure out another solution. So that's the reason we started with a. Uh, uh, some old machinery. We work and we still work uh, with a, a grinder from the 19th century, uh, manufacturer in uh, Eastern Germany. Uh, we have a roaster from the 1950s that we have been completely dismantling and rebuilding. Uh, and some part of the equipment was uh, designed by ourselves, actually, and uh, remade um, by uh, uh, small artisans, uh, steel workers here in, uh, in our region. And starting from the uh, basic um, uh, combination of equipment to produce cocoa, we were able to, uh, uh, to make our first experiments with those, uh, with those uh, special machines. I've, I've had the, the, the honor and the opportunity of visiting your, uh, I, I wouldn't call it a factory, I would call it an, an atelier, I would call it a a museum <laughs> it's it's beautiful and for those out there i mean you need to see this to believe it i literally saw this 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 old grinder which you make your cocoa paste with right that's right that's right and, we, and, we... and th this thing is from the 1800s so this is like medieval times i mean it's crazy <laughs> it's like something you would see in the dungeon of a castle but benoit you I mean, you're, excuse me, and, and this, this is not meant to be, but you're insane. This is, you're a genius. This is incredible. 
you, you must be one of the only people on the planet to use stuff like this. I mean, you're making chocolate like people were making chocolate 300 years ago. That's true. We, we use the old equipment. Uh, and the, the reason uh, for this is that old equipment, um, um, of course, it takes more time to achieve the job, but you don't spoil the raw material. Everything happens at a low temperature, uh, low time. So we don't uh, we, 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 we don't spoil the, the, the cacao bean that has been uh, delivered by the um, by, by the farmers. And that's the most important thing because uh, all the job that has been done at the plantation by you know taking care of all trees first and then having done the um, uh, fermentation and, and drying at the plantation uh, following old uh, procedures, uh, it would be a shame to spoil this with uh, bad equipment. And now, it, it, I'm listening to you, Benoit, and, and you're speaking about you know, going and, and finding the best raw material in the in the in the in the rainforest. I mean, it sounds like Cameroon, Marifal Cameroon tobacco, this almost. I mean, this is crazy. And then you speak about um, you know, fermentation, you speak about selection, you speak about all the machinery, you speak about doing things the old way. I mean, for all of these cigar fans and tobacco geeks and everybody out there, this really, really sounds like the premium cigar industry. Jose, what do you think? Absolutely. I'm really amazed. In this 20 minutes that Benoit has been talking, it just my head is just spinning and spinning and spinning. And we go back to the old time. It, you can make all the equipment in the world. But at the end of the day, I think what Benoit does and what we do in other companies just like us, it's all about the quality tobacco. In his case, it's the quality beans, and the process from keeping up with the with the standards of quality control and innovation. Because when I I have a good friend in Dominican Republic, one of my best friends, which works, he has a process, or I've been there, and he melts and he puts it in fifty five uh, uh, steel uh, gallons. And they melt all that chocolate and he, he puts it on these containers and these containers he sell, he sends them uh, all over the world. And he always told me, and you can confirm this, that actually Ghana is the country that really dictates what the prices of the cocoa bean is going to be. Is that true or false? Um, the, it's not only Ghana, but uh, Ghana and Ivory Coast are the, the biggest producers in exactly. the world. So they have, uh, of course, they have a big impact on the chocolate reality. Um, but it's 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 more the the stock exchange, so it's uh, the speculations uh, that 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 leads the 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 price of the cocoa bean. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, the the most of the time, the price that is given to the farmers. Uh, is 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 not uh, helping them a lot, and even even those who have the stock, uh, the um, uh, fair trade uh, label uh, are not actually uh, helping a lot because the, those are uh, labels that are payable. So um, those who want to have that kind of sticker on the chocolate need to pay those who are going to control. Um, but um, um, the, the the problem is that the extra money that will be made with uh, this label will come back to those who paid uh, for the label so not the farmer but uh, the, probably the industrial who uh, who um, initiated this mm -hmm. professor are you smoking a don carlo robusto yes how did you know that ah, listen i can tell by the smoke <laughs> <laughs> you know what i can i can tell by the smile on your face look at that pull it up put it up so everybody can see it there you go. Look at that. Look at that ash. You know, it's funny. People ask me all the time about the ash. The ash can tell you so much. And maybe later on, Benoit could tell us something about uh, the soil and things like that. But the ash can tell you so much about it. Good old age tobacco. But it doesn't matter how good age the tobacco is. At the end of the day, it's all about the roller. If the roller puts the... Uh, the leaves in the proper position, the bunch, and then puts on the wrapper, and then, you know, the aging and all that. But, but what I, I do have to ask you a question. 
So there's similarities when I'm blending a cigar or Carlito or what are you, the famous uh, master blenders out there. We always look basically, I'm going to skip finish, but maybe that goes in. So the six elements that we look for is flavor, strength, aroma, complexity, balance, and finish. So what are the elements that you are looking for when you're blending chocolate? Because you're blending it, correct? Um, most of the time, we don't, we don't blend, actually. Okay. So, um, but that, that's, that's our... Um, I mean, that's what we, we decided. Uh, so it means that we, um, uh, uh, we go from, to different small plantations and we don't mix the beans from the, uh, the, the different plantations, like, like, like we would do with, uh, with wine, for example. Okay. Well, we're not, so, not all wines, of course, but... Uh, so we have cigars that are mild, mild to medium, medium, medium to full and strong. Mm -hmm. Does what you do, does some of that fall into that milder chocolates or it's just one strength-wise or how does that work? Because look, I just eat them. I don't fucking know anything about them. I just eat them. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 we emphasize in our in our sector in in our chocolate is that um, we we uh, try to compare the different plantations. Um, so the the soil, the way the farmer has uh, um, fermented and uh, um, dried the beans, uh, will determine the of course the the taste of the final product, and um, the the. We we will we will eat chocolate uh, using the the all the senses. Uh, I don't know if it's the purpose to to talk about it now, uh, but we will of course uh, look at the chocolate to see if it is if it's shiny or not. Uh, okay. We will we will hear it and and check if it cracks. Then we will put it in front of our nose to uh, to smell the first uh -huh. uh, aromas, and then put it on our palate and. Uh, have all the um, all the tasting notes, and an indication on the quality of the chocolate will be also the the um, the, the the time it needs to uh, uh, to melt. If if the chocolate uh, melts and goes away very quickly, it, it means that it's not a very good chocolate. A chocolate that is very subtle, uh, uh, for which the taste uh, variations are very uh, subtle. Um, and a chocolate that remains long on the palate will be, a, 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 in contrary, a very good chocolate. That's what we call the fish. Well, let me ask you this. The way I've seen, because I haven't seen uh, cocoa beans in anywhere uh, except Dominican Republic, in uh, mountain areas, and Cotuí is very famous uh, for chocolate. So what I would see was like these concrete, square, uh, hundreds and hundreds of square meters of concrete and then they would just throw the cocoa beans to the sun. Is that the fermentation process or is that no, the that, drying process? That's the drying. That's the drying. First, first the farmers, well, actually, only the farmers we are working with, not all the farmers, uh, they are um, uh, fermentate, uh, fermentating the beans in, um, in uh, wooden baskets of approximately 400 kilos each under banana leaves. And two two times uh, a day, someone is going to uh, to mix the beans uh, in order to have a, um, a fermentation that is homogeneous. And then, when the result is achieved, uh, they will spread the the beans on the floor, or it can be on the roof of a of a house. Um, uh, most of the time, there is a um, a, a rolling roof. Uh, that can come on top of the beans to protect them if it's raining. I've um, seen that. And, and this process is made to uh, um, to to uh, to dry the beans under the sunlight, and that's the best way because you could uh, you could also uh, dry the beans with um, uh, with the oven, for example. But then, if you do that, then you spoil the aromas. The best is to, the best is to. Um, uh, to to do it with only with uh, nature with the sun. Benoit, give us one second because Melanie has to call in 
questions for a very important part of the show, which you don't have to be worried about because in a few minutes, we're going to do what's called nailing the professor. So you're going to be able to sit back, relax, and watch Jose get a lot of pressure from all over. But let, let's let's get the kid to call in the questions. Hey! So you guys, be sure to post your questions in the comments right now so that we can be able to nail the professor. So put your questions in the comments and we'll ask him. And of course, we're going to nail him one of these days. You guys are going to get a bobblehead. Let's do it. Let's do it. And what, what I was saying is very similar because when we are fermenting tobacco, it's just we add to the pilones or the mm -hmm. draws of tobacco that could be five feet, six feet, depending how the crop was, what type could be Connecticut broadleaf, it could be Havana, it could be San Andres, it could be Cameroon. Mm -hmm. So what we do, it's basically water and heat. So it's a natural process. So it seems that, uh, and I've seen those, uh, it's like a rail where they move and it has sink on them to protect the beans uh, uh, when it's rainy. But what is the fermentation process? I'm curious about that. How do you ferment the, the beans? Because one thing is to dry them and one thing is to ferment them, correct? Yes, yes. The, the first step is to fer ferment them. So um, when the, when, when the, the fruit is uh, mature, uh, the farmers are going to cut it. Um, and they will, so, you know, the, the, the fruit is called the caboche, huh? the cacao pod. Um, it's a whole fruit. And the bean is what is inside that fruit. So that means that the, the beans are going to be um, uh, protected by a liquid called the cacao pulp. It's, a, it's a, like a white placenta that is around the bean. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, and, and so when the fruit is fresh and cut, then the beans will go uh, inside the, um, the, the, the wooden basket I described. And the, the fermentation will be uh, started by that pulp that is around the bean. And some um, um, uh, chemical uh, reaction will happen. Part of uh, some elements will go inside the beans. And we can now uh, for sure determine that uh, the quality of the fermentation is going to determine the quality of the cocoa at the end. If, uh, if that process is skipped, if, if the farmer wants to go too fast, uh, we will not be able to have a very nice chocolate at the end. So we have to be uh, very conscious about that and control our, our suppliers for, to, for, for, for this factor. When the fermentation is, uh, is done, uh, then the the, um, uh, the cacao pulp that was around has disappeared, of course, um, and the beans then need to uh, to be put on, under the sun to remove the uh, the moisture. Uh, if we have too much too much moisture, we we don't have the cacao taste, and also we have some risk during, during transportation um, that there will be um, uh, mold or something like this inside the. Um, inside the container. Interesting, very interesting. Yeah, we, there, there are a lot of uh, similarities with the, um, the, 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 the sectors you are active uh, in. Uh, I've, I've been uh, exchanging a lot with uh, Jeremia about this and we, we found a lot of uh, uh, things in common about, about our search of uh, high quality things, the best raw ingredients. We, we, we use a, uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, vocabulary in common. Very interesting. Let me ask you this. If, uh, what in your opinion, and, 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 and now I've, because of all this, I had a whole bunch of questions, but now I got to kind of reinvent myself because the questions would not be, uh, I didn't know. First of all, I didn't know it was only ninety nine percent of uh, uh, of tobacco of uh, cocoa beans were processed. It's only a, a very small, less than one percent of of what you do. Mm -hmm. So, in your opinion, which country produces the best cocoa beans? There, it's it's impossible to say. 
it's like it's like uh, it's like saying that um, uh, for wine that uh, France is the best producer. Uh, actually, in France, you have very high quality wine and uh, poor quality wines as well, and that's the same for cocoa. Uh, you can go in any country around the Ecuador, uh, and you will find a lot of good things and a lot of bad things. So uh, our our um, our our goal actually is to find the very rare beans in whatever country they are. See that uh, that amazes me because what I was going to say could this be a possibility? You have a country that is not maybe so well recognized for growing cocoa beans, but you have a producer in that country that just changes everything. And this happens in the tobacco world also. Is that a possibility? Uh, that's, that's for sure. That's, and it happens uh, more and more. Uh, I can tell you, for example, of people doing very uh, nice things in, uh, in Vietnam, for example. You, you, you cannot imagine that uh, cacao is grown there. But uh, by taking the time to choose the right uh, cacao uh, fruit, ca right cacao tree, uh, by taking care of it, by um, um, uh, fermentating and uh, drying the best way, they are able to produce uh, chocolate that is incredible, actually. So no matter the, the country, the, the, the thing is that you have to work, and I think it's uh, the case, of course, in, your, um, in the cigar industry too, the, the, the key element is, the, is passion, uh, time and respect for, um, for, for for the raw material. Benoit, sit back, relax, because it's time to nail the professor. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to nail the professor. This is my favorite part of the show. Hold on, how do you how do I get this back screen off? Here we go. You ready, Jose? Of course, I'm always ready. I can All see right. I can see those dogs coming out the coming after their backside. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Dear Professor, I like how Alex put deer. This is only coming from Alex, obviously. <laughs> So, in the old days of Cuban cigar making, Cayo well, yeah, Caro Fistol had a very important role. What is Cairo and what is what was its use in the old Cuban cigar making traditions? I, I, to be honest, can you repeat that question again? I'm just, oh. I'm just, I, I, let me oh, let me see. Do you the old days of Cuban cigar making? Cayo Fristo has a very important Thank role. You. What is Cayo Fristo and what is the use in that old Cuban cigar making to this? I don't have no idea about that. Alex, <laughs> this okay. is Alex. the first. Uh, yeah, Nailed. Yeah. Alex, Nailed. you just won your 200th bobblehead. Congratulations. <laughs> well, it was good because, you know, he tried 13 months. So I guess he researched out of, the, out of a cemetery of dead people and came up with this. I wish Carlito would be here. Because I've never heard about that. And by the way, let me clarify Stop! something. You're embarrassing yourself, kidding. No, no, no. This is true. He asked something about plancha last week. You know, if Alex would be more... Okay, Jeremiah, you know that when you ferment tobacco in Cameroon, you put 50 leaves of tobacco all together, or 40, and you put them in a pilon. What he was talking about, that oliva, at oliva tobacco, what they do, instead of having it in a sarta, what they do is they put it leaf by leaf. That's what plancha means. <laughs> uh, look, I gotta gotta I, I gotta give Alex a lot of credit because after three we do too. Four, no, we give uh, Alex a ton of credit. Okay, we're yeah. You know why? Because after four hundred days, 
and a year and a month of shows, and he finally got, uh, 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 got finally! nailed me. No, yeah, no, but I mean, no, his, no, no, his batting no. average is like zero 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 point one. Listen, I I disagree. But I give him credit because when you when you let the when you let the dogs out and that dog rips <laughs> a piece right out of your ass, man, that was like woohoo! Well done, you know, Alex. You yeah! know what we should do? We should have a segment. Let the professor nail Alex, and you'll see how he'll never come back to the show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's 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 stay let's stay courteous with our with our audience, will we? <laughs> I know, I love him. I love him. I love him. We, we Alex, love Alex. Right. Congratulations, Alex. Professor, All right, let's go to the next question. Professor, can you identify the key characteristics of the tobaccos from Nicaragua, Honduras, Ecuador, and the DR? Of course, that's easy. But what that person, Douglas, should have put in there is of what seed. Because if you're growing Habano, oh, I, look, it's very easy. If you're growing Habano and you're growing it in Jalapa, you're going to have more sweetness to it. If you're growing it in Esteli, it's going to be more earthy and more spicy. If you're going to be growing it in Condega, it's going to be like the middle of those two things. So it's the same thing in Dominican Republic. If you grow in Piloto Cubano in La Canela, it's not the same thing as in Mao, Jacagua, or Gurabo. And if you're growing in, 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 in let's say, in, uh, in Honduras, let's say Corojo, it's not the same thing if you're growing in Talanga Valley or you're draw, uh, uh, growing in another part. What is so important? What? The, the, so what is important is for people to know that the characteristics of every tobacco is going to depend on the soil, the pH, the nitrate, the magnesium, all those things. So for next time, it would be better for somebody who wants to know, just say what seed and what country, it'll be easy. Because Dominican Republic grows San Vicente, Piloto Cubano, Corojo, uh, Corojo 99, Criollo 98, Olor, San Vicente. And the same thing happens with all the different countries. We could go to Brazil, Arapiraca, eh, Matafina, Mata Norte, Bayano, all those things. And you can take that same seed and plant it somewhere else, and it's not going to be the same. So remember, wow. Douglas, number one, the seed. Number two, the soil. And when we say soil, it doesn't mean a country. It can mean a, a couple of square feet and then a couple of miles down the road. Like that tobacco balance? is good. It's going to have a different characteristic because of wow. the minerals, because of the, the because of a million and one things that is happening, and even the microclimate. So, start so with Jeremiah, the seed. Go Jeremiah, ahead. how do you how do you start with something like that? Like how do you? I mean, you guys, well, obviously Carlito went into the DR, the first one that was to go into the DR and create a wrapper, correct? And everybody- He was, was like, the first one to successfully uh, create a wrapper, yes. So how did he How did he start going into that? Do you, what research do you need to do before you start and grow a seed in a country? I can't speak for Carlito, and I think that that's a good question to ask him next time he's on the show. Unfortunately, he- He's traveling, so he can't. He's on a plane, so he can't be with us today. But um, in um, in Cameroon, um, it's very simple. We 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 start by searching for the soils, and we we search for very very particular attributes which we know are going to give the tobaccos a typical a certain type of nutrient which we're looking for. You know, it's like it's like. It's like bringing up, listen, it's Mother's Day, right? And there's, you know, some mothers want to breastfeed. Other other mothers want to give soya milk in the bottle. But there's a reason for all of this. And that reason is, you know, what, what do you want to give the child? What do you want to nourish the child? Because the child will take a certain direction when you feed it, you know, a, a certain thing. And, and tobacco is the same thing. If you want if you want the child to come out this way, you got to make sure your soul is in, in this particular world frame. And um, that's what we look for. And then after that, we have, as you know, we have the Marifal uh, Cameroon seed, which is very particular, uh, which grows in a certain way and, and it has a certain taste attribute to it. And um, I think it's, it's, it's not that complicated, Melanie. It's uh, doing things right just takes time and a lot of patience and a lot of investment, but it's actually relatively 
simple, so to speak. You just have to do it the hard way. Yeah. yeah. So doing it the hard way is <laughs> more straining, more stressful. Um, doing things the easy way, cutting corners, then it takes a lot of reflection. You got to start becoming creative. But I think but also, that I also think that taking things the hard way actually makes things easier in the long run. But also, it's a lot of trial and error. Correct, Jeremiah? It's a lot of trial and error. It's a lot not of trial and error. You need to, you know, you, you, you also need the industry to follow along. You know, if you have an industry which basically doesn't really care about quality anymore and gives it up because it's uh, it's more in, in the ideology of, of just quick returns. Look at Benoit Nion. I mean, that's a, the perfect example. He's one of the last of his Mohicans in the, in the chocolate world who's doing things like they did in the Middle Ages with, you know, these 18, these 1700, you know, stone mills or whatever they are, you know, to crush the cocoa, going into the middle of the forest to buy the beans. I mean, you know, this is insane. Like he says, 99.9% .9 of the industry is just remelt, remelted crap. Um, and, and which, which is basically, okay. You know, so that's, another, that's another question that I have. I feel like tobacco, you tobacco, the tobacco world's the same. It's the same. Yeah. You know, like there's, there's a large, large majority of the stuff out there is cutting corners yeah. and, uh, you know, taking, taking, the, but he said that? that most, most of the, most of the chocolate makers out there, the majority of them are actually not even growing their own or not even making their own chocolate. They're buying it from somewhere else. Don't a lot or more, doesn't a more percentage of the cigar industry buy their tobacco from somewhere else? I mean, isn't there only so well, many farmers? They do. What's, what's horrible is that, um, listen, Benoit was explaining, he goes to the middle of the forest and he finds like these tiny little producers you know, who, where he's, he's paying five, 10, 15, 20, 30 times the market price for, for the cocoa bean. Well, the cigar industry is the same apart from the fact that, you know, 99.9% .9 of the tobacco manufacturers or cigar manufacturers are going to try to get, you know, the cheapest leaf. They're going to try to get the leaf, which is the, which has the biggest uh, yield. And Jose can speak hours about this. He worked in the factories. He, he knows he's seen it from his own eyes. You know, how many, how many cigars, how many thousand cigars per pound, you know, can you make? That's how everybody counts. And um, that's the opposite of what a Benoit Nian does. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't matter how many thousand per pound or per whatever it is that you're making. What matters is, is that the product is the best in the world. And so, you know, Nian has become the best chocolate on the planet because of that. And, you know, the Michelin star chefs are raving on about his is the quality of, of, of what he's producing. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that there isn't any compromise. So, uh, you know, again, you know, this is all fitting together. Jose. Uh, Benoit, let me ask you this. What do you mean, Benoit? We're talking to three of us, and all of a sudden you want to bring Benoit. Benoit, Benoit. Oh, no, 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 no. Benoit comes on the show, and that's it. He doesn't want to talk to us anymore. No, no, no. no, no, no. That's all right. Let's let's get Jose out of here. He's, he's causing too much trouble. I'm joking. Melody, well done. Alex, you kicked ass today, as usual. Thank you very much. Back to our guest of honor and the professor. <laughs> Benoit, you see how horrible Jeremiah is. And, and the other thing is, if Carlito would have been here, and, and with all due, like Jeremiah said, Carlito's traveling today was a last-minute thing. He was on for the show, but he had to travel uh, to the company. So it would have been – the ball busting would have been even worse. But I have to ask you this. I have learned so much because every day you learn the same way I learn where I'm in Dominican or Nicaragua or Honduras or – Whatever it is you, you you learn, but it's fascinating. I've never heard anything like this in my life, and with all honesty, if not, I, I I wouldn't say it. What you do is 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 very unique, because for you, that's why I ask you the question: Is there a country that maybe is not recognized as a great producer, and all of a sudden they have this great cocoa beans? And what shocked me was Venezuela, because uh, I always hear. Ghana, I was here, uh, uh, the Ivory Coast, I uh, hear some places in South America, but, but Venezuela really, uh, uh, you know, knocked my socks off. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the most uh, famous producers are um, uh, Ivory Coast and Ghana. Uh, but if you look for uh, high quality uh, 
things. Um, you have to go in remote areas of uh, uh, countries in South America uh, or things like this. Um, uh, Venezuela is a very uh, nice country, but you can also find uh, bad quality there. Um, it, it, it all depends on uh, the, the trees that are uh, selected, the way the farmers are uh, fermenting and drying. And uh, the complexity for, of Venezuela is that the government is giving uh, export licenses to uh, uh, to new uh, companies every year. So it's very complex to have a reliable uh, source of uh, beans from Venezuela at the moment. Uh, political situation is, uh, is a big mess. Benoit, we have a tradition on the show to put our guests of honor in the hot spot. Are you ready? I am. I am. All right. Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the hot spot. So that music was made by Jeremiah, just letting you know. <laughs> All right, so it is so awesome to be sitting here, obviously, with the uh, chocolatier. What would you say would be your biggest pet peeve? Do you know what a pet peeve is, first of all? Uh, no, I'm sorry, I don't. I don't know. Okay, it's something that annoys you often that maybe happens by, let's say that all of your chocolate eating lovers do that maybe might bother you because you know that it's not so like something that would bother you i would i'm, I'm asking what would bother you or what bothers you about people eating chocolate what's something that like maybe like they're not taking in or maybe they have a certain like i like this i don't like this or from, from our customers you mean yes oh. well um Actually, the, the, we, we try to, uh, to let our, well, to let anybody uh, know about the fact that chocolate can be something else than a, a candy. That you can, you know, that you can, you can eat chocolate uh, um, like almost scientifically. And so uh, we teach our, our staff to explain to, uh, uh, to, to, to the customers how to, how to eat chocolate, really, uh, and to, uh, to have pleasure with it. And so when, when, when we know about people who, um, uh, who don't want to take the time to understand what's behind uh, our chocolates, what, how, how to taste chocolate uh, the right way, then uh, we can be frustrated about this. <laughs> so what do they say often that when they're not tasting it properly? Well, what they just, uh, they, they, they just eat it as it was... Uh, uh, as it was, uh, you know, uh, a candy that you find in the supermarket. Um, nice. Yeah. All right. So what was your first ever love in chocolate? What was the first chocolate that you ever fell in love with? Um, it was probably a chocolate made by a company in Italy. Um, uh, and this uh, company was producing chocolate uh, uh, with beans that were coming from a plantation in, Venez in Venezuela called Chuao. Chuao wow. is a very, very uh, beautiful place that produces only uh, 20 tons per year of uh, cacao beans. So, uh, you know, you, you lose, when you produce chocolate, you lose 30% of the weight. Um, uh, because you remove the, the, the shell that is around the bean. So it means that uh, probably something like 14 tons of chocolates are made per year with those beans. And I found it uh, very, very fabulous. So uh, yeah. that was probably my first uh, nice experience uh, with uh, high quality chocolates. Oh, awesome. And okay, so then my final question would be if you could create a chocolate that would entice the entire world what would it look like? like what kind of package what would the shape be what would you think that everybody would go for and, uh, and, and how much how much dark versus milk chocolate 
So the, 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 the thing would be, I think, um, a huge uh, chocolate bar um, in which you would have, um, um, you know, most of the time when you buy a, a piece of chocolate, a tablet of chocolate, you have, uh, the manufacturer has decided for you where you have to cut it, you know, yeah. and all the, all, the, all the parts will be the same. And the, 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 the best one would be a huge uh, tablet of chocolate where you will have um, uh, hundreds of different of sizes where you, cut, you can cut, depending on the time of the day or if you are hungry or not, or if you want to spend time with chocolate, something I like this. It. Oh, <laughs> I love it. So like different sizes of the bars. That's actually really interesting. So we can call it. Yeah. So can, can you make a chocolate the size of like, like my size and call it the kid? We can we can do any size, <laughs> of course. Okay, Jeremiah, my life is done. I'm good. <laughs> I knew this is, was going to turn into a terrible, terrible mistake. Melody, <laughs> thank you very, very much. Thank you, Benoit and Jeremiah. <laughs> thank you, Benoit. Benoit. You did very well. You you survived this episode. This is uh, <laughs> well well done to you. <laughs> Benoit, you. we've talked about chocolate, but a little bird told me also that you are also a cigar lover also. Well, uh, I'm not a specialist as you are. Guys. No, 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 but you yeah. like cigars. Uh, actually, it's, um, I, I know Jeremy for a couple of years now, um, and uh, he's the one who, uh, who teach me some, uh, some basics. Um, and I discovered your word by, uh, by, um, by this uh, fortunate meeting. <laughs> so there's characteristics that you look for in the chocolate so you as a cigar smoker it, it's not whether you're a professional or not that's not important what do you as a master toy maker of chocolate look for in a cigar I, I will I will um, so I am uh, developing since uh, a couple of uh, years already. Uh, I'm uh, developing uh, a product that would be a link between the the, the chocolate uh, sector and uh, and the cigar sector. So I'm trying to uh, to develop a product that will be a combination of both worlds, and that's something very very complex to to handle because both uh, raw ingredients have to um, um, to increase the value of the other, you know, they one cannot uh, spoil the other. Benoit, don't don't give any secrets away to anybody, you know. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and, but but no. To, to to answer your question, um, uh, and I, I think my answer would be the same uh, if you ask me for 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 chocolate. Um, the quality of uh, um, what I would choose um, is something very personal and something that would be different depending on the time of the day. So I would like something strong and giving power at the beginning of the day to give you, you know, the strength to, to start your, your day. Uh, and in the evening, I would be more with a you know, with a with a chocolate or with a cigar that uh, is made to to relax, uh, where you have more time to uh, to to understand the delicacy of those uh, products. Um, so I don't have a ready to use answer. It's something rather complex uh, that will change every day and uh, at the various uh, time of the day, depending on on my mood and depending on. Uh, on um, yeah, on 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 what State I have at that moment. Yes, that's one, right. One last question from me: If you would have the opportunity to have a cigar and one of your chocolates, let's say your your best achievement, your your Emmy Award, your Oscar uh, chocolate with a person, it could be dead or alive, celebrity or not. Who would you choose to have that cigar? Chocolate and of course a nice drink. Who would that person be? Um, it would be Jeremy. 
<laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't say that because uh, you invited me. But uh, really, uh, uh, I met Jeremy um, um, some years ago, and um, uh, I immediately found uh, that uh, we shared a lo the same same passion for true things. Um, our family uh, uh, history is about the same. Uh, we had a lot of things in common, and uh, we exchange regularly about any any topic and uh, um I, I i i consider jeremy as my my brother actually uh, for 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 all the aspects i just told you not a bad choice not a bad choice mm -hmm. <laughs> and jeremy is also also the the, the person who, uh, who who made it possible for me to uh, to understand your cigar world which is a uh, very very deep very uh, um, fascinating fascinating and um, uh, with so many different aspects you cannot imagine see you cannot imagine seeing from the outside um, yes no no doubt it would be uh, to share this with uh, Jeremiah well I look forward one day when I go to Belgium to meet you and have a cigar with you and just have a long chat uh, I hope so too. And uh, my my workshop is uh, is always open, and uh, it would be a pleasure for me also to let you discover our our reality, our world. Your world, reality, your world that is to me, it's unique, it's fascinating, it's it's like something from NASA or something like that. It's just it's it's out of this world. I, I am, to be honest, I am shocked, Jeremiah. <laughs> I'm out of words. I mean, after listening to my friend here, um, it, it was it was a true honor, Benoit, to, uh, to to listen to you for the past uh, to past hour. The the words you've 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 expressed in the last minutes touched me very very deeply, and um, I must admit that uh, I was a bit lost for words, so I was hiding here behind the screen. But uh, be before we get to that, uh, let's let's um, let's launch the last segment of the show, ladies and gentlemen. Rich is riot. Hello, everyone, from uh, the beautiful uh, courtyard at uh, Bush's Cigars in Fairhope, Alabama. We just came back from visiting the beaches over in Flor uh, Gulf Coast of Florida and couldn't miss the show, so we stopped here, and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Gene uh, Bouchon uh, let us use his uh, courtyard here to present today's joke. Uh, I have a couple of quick questions for Benoit, if I might. Uh, I drink a lot of California Zinfandel. Uh, sometimes uh, the Italian version, Primitivo, or uh, Sangiovese. And uh, I do enjoy, while I'm drinking a, a glass of wine, to have a little nibble of chocolate. And chocolate seems to come in, in the U.S. in percentage of cocoa. And is there a way, I particularly like 60% versus what we're having today, which is 72%. Uh, is there a way to select which is the best chocolate to go with a, a wine? Hello, hello. Thank, thank you for your question. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. absolutely. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I have to tell you that um, uh, high quality chocolate and uh, and and combination um, between chocolate and something else has has I have to say nothing to do with the percentage of cocoa. Okay. So actually, um, uh, percentage of cocoa will give you an information about. Um, the quantity of bean that has been uh, used to produce the cocoa, but it doesn't give you any information about the taste of the bean, nor the power of it. Okay. So what you what you have to look for when you choose a chocolate is try to uh, get information about the tasting notes of the chocolate. So a uh, good good producer will inform you on the packaging about the the aromas that you can find in the chocolate. So for the, the wines you uh, you just talked about, 
I would recommend, for example, to go with a, a, a dark chocolate bar uh, made from beans from uh, Madagascar, uh, because Madagascar will give to the, the chocolate uh, strong notes of red fruits, and that that come uh, slightly citrusy at the end. Great. Okay. So this will this will works well in combination with uh, the wines you described, uh, okay. and then of course uh, it's all a matter of taste. So uh, uh, the the best is to to uh, to get yourself your your opinion and make some trials, uh, okay. but don't don't um, don't rely on the cacao percentage. It will not it will not help you. Thank you so much. That's that, that was the answer I was looking for. Something like that, and. Uh, is is your product available in the United States of America? Uh, actually, at the moment, only by um, uh, so by, by by parcel delivery from from Belgium. But we don't have any uh, uh, contract at the moment uh, with any any distributor. Okay. okay. So I just have to hang around with Jeremiah and have him bring some over when he comes to visit. That sounds yeah, like that's good. also a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And great. you know, in the cigar industry, everybody's talking about pairings, what cigar with what alcohol, which wine, which this, which that. And we add chocolate to our mix with a cigar. Brenda's sitting here finishing up a stick right now. And, you know, having your insight into the chocolate has been very good. And listening to what you said about how it's fermented and everything. And uh, uh, it, I'm sure Jose and everyone else is looking and saying, gee, there's so much in common with fine tobaccos and fine chocolates that it's just great. Yes. And I, I, Brenda and I want to thank you for being on today. It's just been enlightening. Wonderful. And, and now comes to the, to the evil part where I have to tell the dirty <laughs> joke. Okay. Well, a um, friend of mine, Jeremiah, was in desired a motorcycle for years and years and years. He just wanted a bike and he finally found one on the internet and went to look at it. It was 10 years old, but it looked brand new to him. He took it for a test ride. He came back and said, how did you keep it in such perfect condition? He says, well, when it looks a little cloudy and it looks like it's about to start to rain, I take some Vaseline and put it all over the chrome and it protects it from the rain. And his friend says, my friend says, that that's great. He paid him cash, drove the motorcycle off. About two weeks later, he's having his wife, or his wife to be, decides to let him meet her parents. And they drive to the parents' house on the motorcycle, and they get there just before they get to the front door. She says, oh, "We have a family custom that you should know. No one can speak during dinner. If anyone ever says anything during dinner, they must do all of the dishes." My friend says, "What are you kidding?" Says, "No, no. You'll see when you go in the house. If you speak during dinner." You have to do all the dishes. So they go in the house, and he looks around, and the living room is stacked with dirty dishes. The kitchen counter stacked with dirty dishes. Everywhere he looked, there were dirty dishes. So he, they sit down at the dining table, start to have dinner. He says, uh, I'm going to win this one. This is going to be easy. So he turns and kisses his girlfriend in front of her parents, and nobody says a word. He says, no, that was not it. He rips off her clothes, bends her over the table, and has sex with her right there in front of her parents. Nobody says a word. He's going, this is unbelievable. He turns to her mother and he says, hmm, she's not bad looking. Grabs her, rips off her clothes, and has sex with her on the table as well. And then he hears thunder and lightning and he says, uh-oh. And it starts to rain outside. And he reaches in his pocket and takes out that jar of Vaseline. And the husband says, all right, I'll do the fucking dishes. <laughs> that was terrible. What is that? A special Mother's Day joke or something? <laughs> My goodness. Thank God we're broadcasting out of Basel, Switzerland. Melanie, I hope you closed your ears there. That was very Melanie. funny, actually. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Melanie. <laughs> she hilarious. apologized. <laughs> Rich, thank you very much. That was beautiful. And uh, Brenda, thank you for putting up with Rich during these moments. We really, really appreciate your sacrifice. <laughs> we got a medal. 50th anniversary coming up in October. She's used to it by now. <laughs> Actually, Rich, to be honest, it's a little bit like, like my wife. I have no idea how they put up with us. No idea. Happy Mother's Day to you, Miss Myberry. Thank you. Tell her I said hello, by the way. Uh, that's funny. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be a show which a lot of people are going to want to rerun 
and rewatch for various reasons. Yes. Yet alone, because you know we have one of the you know probably the most interesting guests ever, and and what and and and, and the the, uh, the the emperor of the uh, the chocolate industry, Melanie. Could you please explain to our guests here tonight how to rerun this show, please? Yes, absolutely, Jeremiah. So you guys, please go to our YouTube channel and be sure to subscribe subscribe and tell all of your friends you can share it as well it's tinyurl.com forward slash the professor show and you can also go to our facebook page and give that bell a little love tap so that you can be subscribed and get and catch us on be notified every time we go live which is every sunday at 2 p.m daylight savings time and you will catch us yes you will Jose, it's that time of the day. We're going to wrap up the show. Maybe a little word for our guest. Well, first of all, Benoit, it has been an absolutely pleasure. I've learned so much. And how would I say it? It's been fascinating just looking at all the similarities of uh, tobacco and chocolate. But what shocked me the most, even though we know that our a lot of people on in, especially Carlito, goes to a lot of farms all over to look at different tobaccos and we have done at Chateau de la Fuente. But it's been fascinating. I pray to God that this pandemic goes away. I plan maybe later in the year or for sure next year, I have to visit Jeremiah. Uh, not because I have to, because I really want to. I've been a big fan of his family with his grandfather, his father, and seeing Jeremiah and Josh grow up and becoming what I would say the saviors of what I consider the best rapper in the world, which is Cameroon. So I want to wish you all the best. You're amazing. You're talented. You're passionate. And I mean, you don't see that every day. So if I would have a hat, I would take it off to you, sir. It has been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure for me too. Thank, thank you very much, very much, uh, Jose uh, and Jeremiah, and Melanie, of course. Um, it's always a pleasure for me to uh, to describe what uh, what I do as a profession because my profession my profession is actually uh, uh, my entire life. Um, I uh, wake up with chocolate and I go to bed with chocolate. I um, I only do this actually, uh, and I do it. Uh, the, the the best uh, I can. So um, thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, and um, you guys, anytime you are in Belgium, don't hesitate to uh, to come and say hello, uh, uh, and I will show you around um, uh, my my workshop, my my uh, uh, old machines, and I will of course let you taste uh, my chocolates. My dear friends. This has been a wonderful moment for a lot of people that are following us today on the various social media platforms and who are going to be following this in the future. Um, I think a, a lot of people are going to learn a tremendous amount of information and passion, the stories that you've shared with us tonight, many cigar aficionados, many lovers, brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers of the leaf who have been following this show today will realize the similarities and the bridges between the premium cigar industry and the finest chocolate making in the world. And they will realize that we use words such as farming, soil, terroir, drying, fermentation, assemblage, manufacturing. These are all words which are shared in, in, in a very, very similar way between the uh, the uh, chocolate making, such as we've heard today from you and the uh, and the cigar industry. And Benoit, I, I need to say that um, you've, you've hit the spot and you've brought so much to so many people today. Um, you've broadened their knowledge and uh, whatever piece of information that you bring to the edifice uh, of, of, of knowledge of taste and knowledge of the finer things in life, I think everybody starts to realize more and more that um, it doesn't really matter which products you're speaking about in the world. 
they all seem to be done in a certain way when they're done properly. And um, who better than the greatest chocolate maker of all time um, to explain that to, uh, to our audience and to our team. Benoit, you've, um, you've been wonderful. I wanted to thank you. You know very well what I think of you. You're as well a brother to me. You're more than a friend. You're someone that in the last decade has become close to me, close to my family. Um, for, for the exact reasons you mentioned, you're a humble, intelligent, human with values which you strive to protect, which are quickly disappearing in this world. And it's wonderful, wonderful to see people like you and your family maintaining them and continuing that legacy. So to my dear friends, I wanted to wish you the best. I wanted to thank you for coming on our show today. It really means a lot to me and to many people out there. And um, until next time, be well. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this was another show of Fuente and Marifal present Meet the Professor. Next week, Mr. Mr. Professor, who's coming on board? Well, next week, we're going to have a dear friend, one that I consider one of the top retailers of uh, the country, my good friend, Kurt Kendall, also owner of 724 Cigars. Good friend of Carlito, known him for 20 years. It's going to be interesting. Uh, he has probably, after New York City, taking Route 95 all the way up, what I consider probably the best shop in the Northeast, Upper Northeast. Fascinating person, passionate, honest. A lot of things to talk about with him. He's done over 20 years of uh, retailing and selling his brand also. But uh, tune in next week because you, we're going to have another great show on Fuente and Merafel meet Jose Blanco, the professor. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. Ladies and gentlemen, another show, Fuente and Merafel present Meet the Professor. Remember to take care of yourselves and of others. And, of course, if you don't do it with passion, don't do it at all. See you next week. Same time, same place. Bye-bye for now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>